Thank you, Hele, and uh, I will uh, start saying how uh, happy I am to participate in that useful and interesting project and the team. And uh, beyond communities, we did some uh, ethnographic work amongst uh, public health institutions at the regional and national levels. And uh, I will share some emerging insights and I have uh, six bullet points to share. But before that, I will mention that uh, previously, it was said that COVID was an opportunity to get prepared, but it was also for us an opportunity to check how previous preparedness was shaped and how it was used and how it was relevant to face this uh, pandemic. So those bullet points uh, we come from analysis uh, from uh, uh, colleagues also. Uh, that will share their uh, presentations later. And uh, the first one is the idea that technical interventions have uh, important social dimensions, in particular historical and social political context with a long-term history, but also a recent history. For instance, the history linked to our previous epidemics or waves as uh, experienced, for instance, with the Ebola epidemic. Uh, so this shapes their inclusion and the importance given to technologies in prepar pre preparation for next epidemics or for next waves. Second, local knowledge and past experience shape the ways new outbreaks and interventions are interpreted and responded to. Uh, we uh, documented this on the uh, after the Ebola uh, epidemic in West Africa and uh, uh, observed how it shaped the response. Uh, not we, we wrote this might not lead to adaptation when sometimes this experience come to as a limitation. Uh, for instance, shaping the re new response to a new epidemic in a medical, medically centered way. Uh, third, third point is about uh, governance of uh, preparation is an assemblage in uh, ideas and practices. It's an assemblage uh, between the global and the national levels, but also the regional level. In this project, we were uh, able to uh, observe uh, the rise of the region, regional level with uh, uh, Africa CDC and also the reshaping of uh, uh, WHO Africa office uh, uh, teams for emergency preparedness and response. And this brought some layers, uh, another layer, and uh, the dynamics were, uh, of course, related to powers. And in studying how powers are, are shifting, that was a key uh, issue. And uh, it's shaped who decides if experience is considered, whose experience, does it go upward or downward? Also, how experience is uh, set in balance with uh, uh, WHO recommendations, for instance, and with uh, also scientific uh, evidence, and whose experience is considered. Another point was about concept of vaccine anxieties that we found more relevant than the dominant framing as a, a vaccine hesitancy, or even as a, the framing in, uh, with the concept of trust, uh, because we, had, we documented very changing uh, attitudes about vaccines, not only about context, but also according to uh, the situation during the pandemic, for instance, um, before the vaccine was there, there were not only hesitancies, but also strong refusal. And uh, later during the epidemic wave, there was a, a, a demand. So the, the notion of anxieties, which is not only negative, but also positive, is uh, uh, more um, relevant. Also, we found that about understandings of infodemics, uh, we found that uh, the um, framing in uh, uh, fake news or rumors is uh, uh, also too limited. In those, again, several layers uh, with, of fake news or, or uh, more general information, uh, several layers from the local to the global, uh, we found that uh, 
the the ideas that circulate are uh, more active and powerful when they articulate and activate previous, previous representations. And uh, we also found some positive aspects of uh, infodemics as a, uh, considered as a, a plenty of information when it, it means giving access to some information that can be also relevant for uh, people. And last was uh, the idea of uh, diversity in approaching technologies amongst uh, institutions and health professionals. Um, two trends, either cumulative innovations uh, considered as strengthening health systems, crisis is an opportunity, or there are exceptional external interventions that will end with the epidemic, with, uh, with crisis and uh, ex exceptionality. So um, I am very um, happy to uh, introduce my colleagues uh, who will uh, develop those aspects. Uh, first will be uh, Dr. Esther Mokua, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at Wageningen University and Research. Then we'll have Prof. Graciela Grace Akello, who is an associate professor at Gulu in university. Dr. Kudiasso will speak in French with my colleague in the uh, Centre de Recherche in uh, Dakar and uh, Anthropologue Medical. And then we'll have a, a video by uh, Lawrence Babao, who unfortunately could not join us today, who is a, a member of this stage committee and a lecturer in two universities in Sierra Leone. Thank you for listening and uh, I give the floor to uh, Esther. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have to repeat my name again. It has already been said. So we did uh, an anthropological research in villages in Southern and Eastern Sierra Leone. I tried to understand delays in the uptake of vaccines for COVID-19, not as vaccines hostility as supposed by some agencies but as a product of recent history in which vaccinating others was not common. Vaccination is not a new idea to Africans. This shows from the national language of Sierra Leone Creole, which uses the word maculate from now rather obscure English word maculate to mark of spot as meaning to vaccinate. However, COVID-19 vaccination challenged some established institutionalized understandings about the nature and purpose of vaccination. During the lifetime of most of our informants, vaccination was largely focused on children. A vaccine campaign focused on older adults with children excluded on grounds of precaution seems strange and worrying. Our research tracks leech and fear health vaccine anxieties framework in which it is important to consider social context. We began by considering local traditions such as the insertion of some herbs with a knife into body tissue for, for protection against snake bites, food poisoning, et cetera. Informants, we are clear that this form of local insertion or marking, we is not the same as maculate. They understood maculate to be a distinct and valid set of practices associated with scientific medicine, but one which had acquired local associations as well. Through Sierra Leonean contribution, perhaps notably the smallpox advocated in the 19th century by Dr. James Africanus Hockton. COVID-19 vaccination, however, was a breach of parasocial expectations. Informants widely believe it takes several years to make a safe vaccine and wonder why people were offered a vaccine in less than a year. Historical experience of money making is rooted in the slave trade where bodies were bought and sold for profit. This suspicion that Africans' bodies 
are still targeted by global medical commerce is widely shared. People had difficulties in recognizing COVID-19 as a disease separate from other respiratory infections. Others thought the bylaws for COVID-19 were just as effective as the bylaws for Ebola, and only later realized bylaws do not really control COVID-19 in the same way. Our conclusion is that Vaccine campaign needs to be more thoroughly grounded in the local historical experiences and cultural understandings of the communities concerned. In particular, the paradox of a vaccine needed by older people but withheld from young on protective ground requires better explanation. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Esther. We are going to listen to Grace Akello. Thank you, Alice. And thank you for in inviting me. So in, in Uganda, I did an ethnographic study in the districts of Kampala and Wakiso, and then also in the districts of Kasese and Gulu. In these districts, I talked to villagers, to clinicians. I talked to people in the district task force. And that's why I mentioned the military and also clinicians in the, in the hospital task force. I also talked to members in the National Emergency Operation Center, which is, which is an office basically put in place to respond to health emergencies. And sometimes they respond to some disasters in the country. In this 21, ethno, 21 months ethnographic study, I also talked to global health partners. In Uganda, this is a very important niche. And they are not only people to provide technical assistance say like at the World Health Organization, but they also provide the logistical aspects in disease containment. For instance, the CDC, the uh, uh, well, the uh, Baylor, there is also Red Cross and so on. So in the 21 months ethnographic study, what I discovered, especially concerning co containment of COVID, there were many contradictions. There were many disjunctures and, and unequal power relations in disease containment. For instance, there were contradictions in an area of COVID vaccine rollout while villagers and even clinicians were asking, is it necessary for, a, for people to be given a vaccine for a disease which was experienced mostly as mild, asymptomatic? But on the other side, on the other hand, the global health partners were asking the question, how fast, how fast can we make the people access the vaccine? And this question, forced them to do a campaign mode for COVID-19 vaccine. In the campaign mode, the vaccine would be extracted from the normal routine supply chain, whereby vaccines are taken to hospitals and people willingly go to the hospitals to, to be vaccinated. But instead, the vaccine would be taken to social spaces and offices. They would be taken to funerals and for instance, at parties and, and playgrounds where people would be encouraged to take the vaccine. But this is against the backdrop that people were no longer trusting state responses for the vaccine. For instance, they had, like my colleagues say, they had experienced immense authoritarianism in response. People were incarcerated, arrested, forced to take the vaccine. And so by the time, you again come in a different way to encourage them to take the same vaccine. There was still hesitancy and anxiety. Like what Melissa, Melissa Leach discusses, although they were seeing the vaccine as a good technology, which could help to prevent the disease or to even uh, make the immunity better so that when they get the disease, they will not be sick they still hesitated to access this vaccine. And the question then arises, 
how can we involve people's ideas? How can we engage communities to the extent that their ideas, their priorities, and their perspectives are integrated in the, in the disease containment approaches and in the pandemic preparedness and response? Also, I can tell that the clinicians are a bit wary about the, the responses and how they were asked to respond to COVID-19. For instance, in the many hospital task forces, they talked about untraditional approaches, being told to admit asymptomatic patients and to monitor them for 14 days. This is in spite of the lack of many uh, health equipment in the health center. This is in spite of the shortage of staff for other departments. And this non-traditional clinical approach was critiqued over many months in, 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 during COVID-19 containment. And up to this day, clinicians are a bit uh, skeptical about what to do and to what extent they can obey or follow the state and global health uh, policies in, co in containing pandemics. Therefore, in this study, we have discovered mostly contradictions, disjunctions, con and unequal power relations in global health response. For instance, we have seen that what the global health partners propose and even enforce is normally contradictory to what the local or villagers' needs are. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. It was really interesting. We are going to listen to Kudiaso, who is uh, in Dakar. Merci. Je voudrais remercier les organisateurs de vous donner la parole pour partager euh, cette, euh, les résultats euh, de notre travail, de l'enquête que nous avons menée au Sénégal sur euh, l'analyse de la réponse et de la préparation des épidémies au niveau du Sénégal et au niveau des instances régionales. Donc d'abord, euh, je vais partager avec vous euh, les quelques éléments de la réponse, quatre points de la réponse au COVID qui ont marqué la réponse au COVID. Le premier point, c'est quelles ont été les attitudes des populations. Au Sénégal, les populations ont d'abord adhéré à, aux mesures de santé publique dans un contexte où elles ont très peur de l'épidémie à COVID. Et puis, euh, elles ont accepté les mesures de restriction de santé publique qui ont été promulguées. Et puis très vite, les conséquences de ces restrictions ont été incompatibles avec des personnes qui travaillent essentiellement dans le secteur informel. Donc, elles se sont, les populations se sont progressivement révoltées et ont refusé d'adhérer aux mesures de restriction. Le deuxième point, c'est le système de santé. Le système de santé a été, dès le début, assez résilient avec l'expertise qu'il a eue sur la gestion de l'épidémie de COVID et de l'épidémie d'Ebola et, et du VIH. Et cette résilience, petit à petit, s'est essoufflée parce qu'elle a été dépassée par les capacités de réponse aux épidémies, notamment avec une augmentation de cas compliqués qui nécessitaient euh, des, des équipements sophistiqués dont ils n'avaient pouvait, pouvait pas, euh, euh, qui n'existaient pas, notamment tout ce qui était la réanimation des cas compliqués. Le troisième point, c'est la gouvernance. Ce que nous avons appris, cette épidémie a été placée dès le début sous une approche, euh, euh, sous une tutelle politique et biomédicale, avec une institutionnalisation euh, euh, des décisions qui ont été prises parfois en haut euh, et up-down, sous le modèle up-down, et parfois qui étaient en dévasage avec les réalités telles qu'elles étaient vécues par les acteurs, euh, les populations. Et avec le souci des gouvernements de contrôler les informations épidémiques, et on a vu apparaître une des formes de nationalisme sanitaire où finalement euh, les les, organ les, les, les organisations internationales de la santé ont eu assez peu d'influence. Euh, le, deuxième, le quatrième point, c'est la mobilisation communautaire. 
globalement, la mobilisation communautaire elle a été tardive et insuffisante, malgré une participation précoce des populations qui se sont souvent elles-mêmes auto-organisées euh, et dans un contexte de multiplication de multiples informations et d'infodémies et qui, ont, qui les ont amenés finalement à mettre en place dans les médias des espaces où de démocratie sanitaire, où les gens pouvaient s'exprimer publiquement, y compris des efforts. Et cette mobilisation, cette insuffisance de la mobilisation communautaire a conduit, euh, euh, dans un contexte où la population était assez méfiante vis-à-vis -vis du vaccin, à finalement faire que malgré s'il si, euh, y a eu des fluctuations sur la, sur la vaccination, comme on a parlé à l'issue tout à l'heure, in fine, euh, le Sénégal a l'un des taux de vaccination les plus faibles euh, euh, qui pourraient être liés à cette insuffisance de la mobilisation communautaire en partie. Le, et donc, qu -ce qu y a, quelles sont les implications en termes de préparation des épidémies Ce que notre travail nous montre, c'est que d'une part, il y a eu une augmentation euh, de la perception du risque euh, épidémique. Cette épidémie a mis en avant l'importance d'une bonne préparation euh, des épidémies parce que le système de santé n'a pas, pas euh, a, a été globalement impréparé par rapport à cette épidémie-là. Mais un élément qui nous ramène à la nécessité d'un renforcement du système de santé avec plusieurs dimensions en termes de ressources humaines, en termes d'équipement, mais aussi en termes d'implication du système communautaire. On a beaucoup parlé des systèmes communautaires et là, cette épidémie aussi nous rappelle et nous a rappelé la tendance des États à, à venir euh, euh, avoir cette gestion biomédicalisée avec une insuffisance d'écoute sociale. Euh, nous sommes heureux que l'OMS parle maintenant d'écoute, ne parle plus de surveillance communautaire, mais ne parle d'écoute sociale et, euh, et que cette écoute sociale, qu'elle soit mise en place au cours des épidémies et qui permettent d'analyser aussi les comportements, les perceptions des populations tout au cours des épidémies. En termes de préparation également, on a vu les limites du dispositif institutionnel de coordination qui est basé sur l'urgence sanitaire. Souvent, au Sénégal, ce sont les dispositifs d'urgence sanitaire qui ont, dans, le, dans un premier temps, coordonné les épidémies. Or, ces dispositions d'urgence sanitaire ne sont pas suffisamment en faille avec, en rapport avec euh, les, ceux de la coordination euh, du système de santé. Donc, la préparation aussi, c'est revoir les dispositifs institutionnels. Et je voudrais terminer sur le dernier point, sur euh, 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 la... La, la, les mesures exceptionnelles, l'importance, parce qu'en termes d'épidémie aussi, se préparer, c'est préparer euh, des mobilisations financières, des mobilisations sociales et qui nécessitent la possibilité pour les systèmes de santé d'avoir des mesures, euh, la capacité de mobiliser des dispositifs exceptionnels, notamment euh, autour de la vaccination des adultes en capitalisant les expertises sur le VIH, sur Ebola, des autres pays qui n'ont pas été suffisamment utilisés pendant cette épidémie. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Kudia. And uh, of course, it's a challenge to uh, discuss from technology to system, and we have broad issues to discuss. So now we are going to listen to uh, Laurence Babao. Uh, more uh, acutely, we are going to watch his uh, video. My name is Lawrence Babao, a member of the Pandemic Preparedness Project and also a member of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Group for Emergencies that was appointed by President Julius Mada Bill on the 23rd of April 2020 to advise him on the COVID-19 uh, interventions. Uh, We had a broad mandate, and the broad mandate was to provide real-time scientific advice and insight from research and state-of-the-art technological interventions that will go to informing what the activities will be like for the COVID-19. And then we also had a goal, which was to advise uh, on prevention and mitigation through the use of robust public health interventions 
that we are going to help to mitigate or that we are going to help to stop the spread of the infections. Uh, that is a COVID-19 uh, infection. Now, what was our approach? One of the approaches we used was a weekly scheduled meeting. And in those meetings, we would analyze the data that has been presented from the various pillars. And then based on that, we can now inform or advise the president through the presidential task force. We talked about vaccination. There were a lot of uh, conspiracy theories around vaccination. Uh, but we tried to advise government as to how to disperse some of those conspiracy theories. We did, for example, when we had that people said, oh, this is, people have come with uh, medication to kill our people, to make people important and that kind of thing. So we, we suggested to government, we advised government on what needed to be done in those areas so that people will understand that this, is, this was a disease and it needed uh, ways and means of combating it. The last thing we also look at uh, sustainability. How would all these things be sustainable? In that regard, we looked at uh, capacity building, where we emphasize that the personnel needed to be trained, the infrastructure needed to be improved upon, and the equipment or the facilities that were supposed to be used for the COVID were supposed to be available at all times. And then we also realizing the fact that uh, every outbreak is anchored on research. We emphasize on research, and there were organizations uh, during the COVID outbreak that were actually engaged in research. And some of the results of this research actually informed our uh, advice, some of the, the, the pieces of advice that we gave to government. Uh, being a member of the Pandemic Preparedness Pro Project and also being a member of the uh, Scientific Technical Advisory Group for Emergencies, we use we use some of those things that we found and we discovered in the pandemic preparedness project. For example, at quarantine, and we did, we, we did discuss those things at, at, at a very, very uh, extensive uh, level. And we, we advised government on those issues. Even lockdowns, how lockdowns were supposed to be done so that it doesn't affect the livelihood of people, etc., etc. We look at those things. Even the use of the local communities, the local leaders was an, a, an issue that we discovered in the, uh, that we found out in the Pandemic Preparedness Project, which was used by state to inform government, to advise government. So those were some of the issues that we, we actually were engaged. I thank you for your attention, and I hope this makes some sense to you. Thank you. So now we are going to uh, listen to uh, Fred Martino, our colleague who is a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he will introduce discussions. Thanks, Alice. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our four discussants for this uh, session. We are very lucky to have Prof Anne Kelly, who is a professor of anthropology and global health at King's College London. Uh, Dr. Tiano Bolde, uh, an associate professor at University Université de Montréal, and also the regional COVID-19 incident manager for WHO Africa Regional Office. Uh, Dr. Julienne Anoko, who is a social anthropologist and the focal point for social sciences and risk communication and community engagement pillar, uh, pillar lead at the w, also at the WHO lead, Regional Office for Africa. And finally, Dr. Kathy Roth, a senior research fellow and health advisor for the health research team at the FCDO in the UK. In the UK, um, so we're going to have about uh, up to maximum five minutes to each discussion, perhaps a bit less. I will politely interrupt you if you're reaching that time, um, but hopefully uh, we will be able to fit everyone in. Okay, um, Anne, would you like to start us off? Great, thank you so much, Brad. It's so um, lovely to be here. And first, I just want to compliment um, the presenters on their elegance and clarity um, and really their respective modesty on kind of di distilling key messages from what I know is exceptionally challenging work. And I think that that is not <laughs> said enough. So there's just a couple points that I think I want to, you know, really echo and amplify about what's already been said. Um, and the first is really how the presentations underscored the importance of anthropology in drawing attention to the styles of reasoning. And you know why I say that, and again, those who are anthropologists, those will seem kind of old hat, is that 
the general sense of anthropology is that it's about revealing other people's culture and beliefs. Um, and looking back on Ebola, the Ebola outbreak from the purview of COVID, you know, it's striking how anthropological insights were sought, um, primarily because the affected communities were seen to have some kind of esoteric traditions that anthropologists would have some purchase on revealing, and therefore their perspectives were important. And I think what's so powerful, this consortium and kind of connecting and going across pandemic preparedness is to show not only the kind of sensitivity to kind of local worlds and meanings, but also the kind of universality of those logics, you know, whether it has to do with entirely reasonable concerns over the speed of R&D, the safety of products, their provenance, I mean, concerns that were really widely shared across the globe. So I think that kind of point about shifting power in pandemics is also the work of showing that culture is not just the province of particular peoples, but is, you know, a nexus of shared meanings, interests, and values that are dynamic and cross-culturally legible. So, I mean, I think that is an incredibly point, important point to underscore. And secondly, and this really comes through, I think, in some of the presentations, is that those kind of styles of reasoning are shaped by the politics of a given moment, right? Um, Vina Das once described really helpfully epidemics as critical events, right? Highly volatile and polarizing moments where social and political orders are really upturned and identity um, is at stake. So, you know, public health interventions, which are already so socially complex, you know, become, you know, under the best of circumstances, become in these critical events, just, you know, they gain amplitude and they become incredibly fraught. So just to say, kind of underscore the importance that has already come up in discussion and that's been really, you know, made by these present presenters as well, is that the exceptional moments, the kind of critical events, you know, have to have be tethered and embedded um, in the kind of everyday, right? In institutional mechanisms that deal with other kinds of public health and building those links that allow you to kind of see the exceptional outbreak response is actually part of the trust that you build into local systems. And this group has produced um, a really nice paper on vaccine preparedness, which I would recommend to you all, which makes this case that beyond kind of readying populations to receive vaccines, that part of that work is upstreaming engagement with the whole range of R&D activities. Um, Lawrence mentioned kind of research is part of the response and that this has to be part of how we think about kind of the, the forms of trust and engagement so that people know why vaccines have been produced so quickly. So I think again, that is a really important area of study and engagement that that kind of um, power shifting from below um, should throw attention on. And finally, and this is my last point, Fred, I promise I won't go over, <laughs> is to mention again the challenge and delicacy of this work. And, you know, this really struck home for me because, you know, I'm in a department of global health and social medicine whose logo is health is more than a medical matter. However, it was clear during COVID um, the kinds of critical engagement that we're used to doing as social scientists, you know, kind of unpicking epidemiological data, you know, looking at the broader social implications of large scale policy interventions was really hard work to do in a moment where we had to, you know, demonstrate solidarity, you know, support the NHS. And I think a lot of us really lost our critical footing. We had no idea what to say or where we should sit. So, I mean, I mean, just to say that this is incredibly challenging work um, doing anthropological engagement and how you kind of build both the frameworks for empathy with the pandemic response and clarify the kind of rationalities concerned while at the same time trying to save lives and support health systems um, strengthening and delivery. And it's a truly precarious balance, but I do think it's one that this project and platform really is a masterclass on how you pursue and how you strike it. Because it's not you know, just about shifting power, by, power in pandemics from below, but it's about doing that work continuously you know, between outbreaks and before to allow the kind of critical so social scientific work that allows you to you know, attenuate the kind of critical event as a source of massive disruption. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Perfectly to time. Um, and get to end on a challenge for ourselves as well as uh, everyone else. Okay, uh, Tiena. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for really the opportunity. Uh, so maybe I might go in French uh, just to have a bit of balance. Um, Please do. Just to, yeah, thank you. So uh, je pense que vraiment, je vous remercie. 
Je vous remercie beaucoup pour cette opportunité de, me, de, de pouvoir intervenir dans, dans, dans ce débat-là. Il y a eu beaucoup d'échanges, je trouve ça extrêmement enrichissant. Le, le principal point ici que je voudrais peut-être mentionner d'abord pour commencer, c'est l'importance que vous essayez de rapporter sur les sciences un peu sociales et puis anthropologiques, donc dans la gestion des urgences de santé publique. En vous écoutant, je veux me faire un peu l'avocat du diable en se demandant qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire différemment par rapport à tout ce que l'on a entendu. Et ça, je pense que ça, c'est une question importante. Souvent, on a tendance à se dire, OK, on devrait, il y a telle chose qu'on n'a pas faite ou il y a telle autre chose qu'on n'a pas faite. Moi, je, suis, je travaille beaucoup plus dans les opérations, donc dans les, dans les choses de, du jour au jour. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on aurait pu faire de différent dans les conditions que l'on sait dans l'incertitude que nous avions donc dans cette COVID-là, 19, et dans ce que nous savons un peu, uh, sorry. <rire> so, dans, les, dans, les, dans les conditions que nous avions. Donc ça, je pense que c'est vraiment une question fondamentale parce que j'écoute beaucoup les, 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 les présentations des sociologues, des socio-anthropologues, et on se pose souvent la question, on doit faire ci, ça mais dans la réalité, dans l'action exactement, dans la réponse, je ne parle pas de la préparation ici, dans la réponse, qu'est-ce que nous pouvons vraiment faire, qu'est-ce que l'on peut changer différemment? Je pense que c'est une question, je n'ai pas tant que ça à la réponse, mais je pense que c'est une question vraiment qui est importante, qui mériterait vraiment que l'on puisse s'attarder là-dessus pour se dire peut-être une meilleure préparation nous devrait passer en répondant à cette question-là. Le, 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 le second point un peu que je voudrais mentionner toujours en lien un peu avec le, 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 la dimension temps, on sait très, très, très bien le temps que ça prend quelque part pour changer des comportements, pour comprendre des comportements. Donc, qu'est-ce que l'on prend comme temps dans, une, dans, dans, dans des phénomènes qui, 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 où les gens meurent à tous les jours, où on a peur que les gens meurent à tous les jours Donc, Qu'est-ce que l'on peut faire véritablement, une fois de plus, là aussi, pour agir sur ces éléments-là Peut-être que la, la, la collègue qui a intervenu auparavant, peut-être qu'elle a soulevé des enjeux importants. Ah, comment est-ce qu'on fait ça en différentes crises, en différentes pandémies Peut-être qu'on accélère là, la préparation. Mais toute chose étant différente, quand Ebola est arrivé en 2014, en Afrique de l'Ouest, c'était la première fois, les gens ne le savaient pas. On était tous perdus. Avec la pandémie de la, de, de la COVID-19, on était aussi tout, tous perdus. Donc, de, ce degré d'incertitude-là, je pense que ça, vraiment, il faut qu'on qu le prenne vraiment en considération et qu'on se dise, si on veut être le plus réaliste pour la prochaine fois, il faut qu'on accepte de gérer avec cette incertitude-là. Donc, euh, et, et, et peut-être un des derniers points, peut-être qui pourrait davantage dessiner un peu une espèce de solution ou d'avenue, c'est peut-être vraiment ces ponts-là qu'on devrait bâtir. Euh, moi, je vous écoutais tout à l'heure, j'entendais beaucoup de choses, je, je promets beaucoup à le home base care et tous ces différents éléments-là, mais je vois ici les, les, les effets. Toute chose a toujours des implications. On essaie de les retrouver, ces implications-là, et peut-être qu'on apprend de ces implications-là. Mais moi, j'y crois fermement. Mais comment peut-être qu'on doit accroître davantage ce dialogue-là? Donc là, je ne sais pas très, très bien cette communauté qui est là. C'est une communauté peut-être de socio-anthropologues, socio une communauté peut-être de, de médicaux, de... de, de, de d'agents de santé publique qui travaillent tous les jours. Peut-être que si on s'écoutait un peu plus, si on s'entend un peu plus, probablement on peut essayer de trouver donc des solutions dans, quand les choses arrivent, parce que c'est de là où on a besoin des solutions. Ce n'est pas les solutions peut-être a posteriori, probablement, qu'on a souvent du mal après à mettre en œuvre. Donc, je pense que c'est une problématique extrêmement complexe. Euh, c'est un débat qui commence, les gens commencent à se connaître, les gens commencent à s'entendre, euh, l'approche biomédicale, l'approche sociale et tout cela. Les gens commencent à, à se comprendre un peu plus, mais il y a énormément de travail à faire dans ça. Il faudrait peut-être qu'on accepte tous de sortir un peu de nos différents, de nos différents coins et peut-être venir ensemble pendant que les choses se passent, discuter ensemble, voir les difficultés, voir les complexités et les adresser pour que peut-être les solutions qu'elles viennent vraiment de nous tous en tant que tels pour, pour pouvoir les adresser. Donc, euh, voilà, je vais me limiter à là et puis je vous remercie beaucoup de m'avoir invité à cette, à cette rencontre. Merci à vous. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, lots of uh, interesting points there. I think uh, we've all uh, tried to deal with the... Um, Excuse me. Um, we've all tried to grapple with the, um, the issues around time and timeliness within urgent responses, which I think is something that uh, anthropologists have really <laughs> struggled with in particular. But I think also on the flip side, 
how we manage to engage people with the need to take things slowly sometimes even when the world is going crazy around you and some things just do not happen overnight and actually carving out the time for that is what is really needed um but thank you very much so now julien um it would be great to hear from you bonsoir et bon après midi merci de m'avoir invité à cette rencontre pour partager uh, uh, mon point de vue qui est un point de vue que je vais retrouver déjà chez tous ceux qui sont passés. Féliciter tous ceux qui ont pr présenté les recherches qu'ils ont faites dans des conditions assez difficiles, il faut l'avouer. On vient d'écouter les autres collègues qui nous parlaient de la militarisation. Et moi, ce que je, voulais, je voulais vraiment parler de la question du vaccin. Le vaccin, on a raté l'opportunité d'expliquer de, que le vaccin est un produit. C'est un produit manufacturé. Or, entre le produit manufacturé et la vaccination, il y a au milieu l'engagement communautaire. Il faut que quelqu'un accepte de prendre le vaccin. Et cette, 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 cette vide-là, cette partie-là est restée vide pendant longtemps où il faut vendre un produit avec des stratégies de marketing pour que la personne qui va recevoir le produit voit les bénéfices de se faire vacciner. Pourquoi quelqu'un va se faire vacciner d'un vaccin dont on voit les laboratoires faire la course pour le produit, déposer les candidats vaccins très rapidement, où on n'a pas confiance au produit, on n'a pas confiance aux gouvernants qui essayent de vendre le produit, où il y a les théories de complot, les rumeurs, la désinformation, tout ça, on a raté l'opportunité de vendre un produit manufacturé pour convaincre quelqu'un en lui démontrant quel est le bénéfice qu'il va avoir en acceptant de prendre ce produit. Ça, c'est une chose. Le deux, la deuxième chose sur laquelle je, je, je voudrais vraiment euh, 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 travailler, discuter, c'est la question de la préparation aux urgences. La préparation aux urgences par rapport à la recherche en sciences sociales, qui dont l'importance n'est plus à démontrer aujourd'hui. Cette préparation aux urgences, elle a besoin qu'on puisse trouver une approche d'équilibre, un équilibre entre les paradigmes et les systèmes biomédicaux bien enraciné avec les systèmes communautaires et les paradigmes culturels. On doit essayer de trouver cet équilibre. Tant qu'on n'a pas trouvé cet équilibre, on reviendra toujours, comme venait de dire Dr. Balde tout à l'heure, sur qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pendant la réponse, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire pendant la réponse. Il a raison, mais ce qu'il faut faire, il faut qu'on travaille en amont de la réponse qu'on construise cet équilibre, ce partage des responsabilités. Mais aussi, cela demande une écoute, beaucoup d'humilité pour qu'on puisse s'asseoir à la table de discussion avec nos communautés et travailler sur une véritable coopération qui reconnaît le rôle et la valeur de chaque acteur autour de cette table de dialogue pour trouver ensemble des solutions et euh, euh, sauver des vies. J'aimerais terminer en disant, qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire aujourd'hui pour faire cette préparation aux urgences. Je pense qu'il est lieu de systématiser la préparation aux urgences, mais du point de vue de la communauté. On a beaucoup parlé de comment est-ce que nos communautés peuvent être prêtes. En anglais, vous dites ça, readiness. Comment peut-on dire qu'une communauté est prête? Il est peut-être temps de systématiser cette préparation de nos communautés et que ce soit accepté, parce que tant que c'est systématisé par nos institutions, on pourra faire descendre cette systématisation au niveau des États membres et, et travailler avec nos communautés que nous soutenons chaque jour. Donc, voilà un peu les aspects sur lesquels je voudrais intervenir sans entrer dans beaucoup de détails parce que le temps est limité. Et puis, je vous remercie et je suis ouverte à quelques questions pour plus d'informations. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Julien. Um, and yes, I think the questions of how we can incorporate all of this into the kind of the systematized response without losing the kind of local adaptations that we're all talking about, I think is really crucial. Um, and finally, for this discussion, we've got uh, Kathy Roth. Hi, Kathy, go for it. Hello, everybody. And um, I should first start by explaining that unlike most of the previous speakers, I am not a social scientist. I am a physician and a medical virologist, having worked for many years in global health. And I was extremely, extremely affected and impressed by the variety of perspectives, how so many issues, similar issues were experienced differently in different places, even though some of the underlying problems were the same. And uh, one issue which did come out regularly was this issue of measures, interventions, responses not being adapted to local conditions because little attempt had been made to understand them, even 
things like the clinical guidelines adapted from global guidelines, but without reference to the communities and how they should be adapted. This idea that adaptation is an across the board thing and of course not. How to get the community voices actually informing the preparedness as well as the immediate response and of course responding to uh, an, an exceptional and scary event where there's a lot of social and political anxiety is virtually impossible. How do we how do we make these responses grounded in the routine and the familiar so that even if adaptation is necessary, we're starting from a point of comfort and understanding. And I was asked to speak about technologies, so a slightly different uh, set of topics than the previous speakers, although I'm trying to take into account what they have all said. And in particular, noting the comment that vaccines, pharmaceutical treatments, and diagnostic tools are not neutral instruments, but have important social dimensions, landing in particular historical and social political contexts. And then asking the questions, what might inclusive systems preparedness look like in different contexts? And we've heard a lot about vaccines, I think, and, and quite a bit about clinical care. But one thing we haven't heard about at all is diagnostics and how diagnostics have something I think very important to, uh, to offer for preparedness. And I'm thinking in particular for diagnostics as well as for the other things I've mentioned, um, what kind of technologies are needed and what kind of technologies are available to do this work, to tether the exceptional response in the routine and familiar. And obviously we need international research and development and we need national systems to intervene with, but we also clearly need and lack in many cases, the local element in the development and the selection of the technologies and ensuring that they are selected to use regularly for problems which are regularly identified as local problems so that they are familiar and so that indeed they can help identify when unusual events present. And I really loved the, uh, last speakers uh, reframing surveillance and even community-based surveillance into social listening. Because I think that this is the kind of approach that can inform up and not simply protect a community response. Uh, first of all, I think there the questions are at the community level, what are we seeing now, both in the immediate moment and in reference to what we've seen in the past, if we had simple diagnostics available for the diseases which are regularly faced by the community in regular use, affordable, continuously available, simple to use by non uh, super specialist actors, we would have a much better idea of what was going on, what is normal, what is abnormal, and uh, people perhaps would have trust in these diagnostics because they would know that they were being used not only for an event with which uh, people at political levels found disruptive and perhaps scary, but for their own needs. Uh, and uh, I think that this is something which is really possible with current technologies. It won't happen by accident. Commercial forces will select the things of commercial value, but communities need to be able to determine for themselves uh, what is needed, what are the necessary products, and then how are they to be evaluated? Uh, and here I think there's another question about what research is required to understand and evaluate what we need and who generates those research questions and who determines what are the necessary products. And we're used to a process where we pick up on things which are generated at a distance rather than uh, expressing our needs and requiring and encouraging the production and access to what is needed at a local level for local health problems. And then when we do have the exceptional event and improvisation is necessary and utilized, how can we assess safety, protection, value, and harms? We've heard about the failure to consider that if continued you access. Up now, Kathy. Sorry? You start to wrap up now, please. Uh, this is it. This is the last question. Uh, we, we, we've, we've heard about uh, failure to consider that 
in the introduction of important considered to be public health interventions uh, that the issue of uh, continued access to food supplies was not considered. So how do we have a continual process in our preparedness uh, for improvisation, but also to continuous assessment of safety, protection, value, and harm? So um, I think I will stop there. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so we've got about five minutes now um, for questions. Um, and uh, I'll start just with one that's in the chat, and then there might be a time for a few more in French if um, if we get to it. But I think this is from Yara, Yara Alonso, probably aimed at Esther, um, who says, with regard to cases of Sierra, to the case of Sierra Leone and the narratives on money making, did you find these were at times also discussed by comparing the abundance of the Ebola money? that poured into the country during the Ebola epidemic with the experienced economic scarcity during the COVID pandemic? If so, could you share your own views on these? Esther, are you there? Are you able to reply to that? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. I, I muted my, my speaker. Anyway, thank you so much for the question. It's very interesting. Uh, I will say a little on this, but I would like my research assistants to comment on it. If they are stuck, then I will, well, if you can, if you want me to answer it, I can answer it, but I want them to talk more in this uh, panel, if that is allowed. So Marion, is Marion there? Can you say something on this? Because we are in the field. Hello? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, during the time of Ebola, from the research and inquiries made, there was lots of money in the country and even some of these nurses we are willing, happy to work for the Ebola because there, there were some additional money being dropped in their phones every month, which they call uh, Jesus Never Fails. And during the time of COVID, there was uh, a great scarcity, and even what was given to the to, to, to the government, most of those things were used by gov government government officials, like the luxury vehicles, and there were no money in the country. So this even made mo uh, most of those nurses relax, and they could not work as they did during the time of Ebola. Uh, Fode, Fode, can you say something? Uh, yeah, let me just come in uh, with some points on this money making. You know, you know, during Ebola, uh, uh, there are a lot of money we are poured pour in in the country. You know, in the in the bid of fighting this uh, Ebola, and we also how people died really during the, the cause with Ebola. There was a lot of problems that people did not understand at that time when it struck a lot of deaths uh, occurred really so government tried to make some strategies you know crying money came in from all quarters in the country so all this money that came in at the time of the then government apc i'm not talking about politics here but it was the government that was in power they really put 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 some strategies in place to really fight the ebola so what they did just to start with they they they, they introduced this dignified barrier you know all this dignified barrier was just introduced because people, are, people, people don't really understand how to, to, to engage in this barrier. When their loved, one, their loved ones die, they, they go very close to the corpse, not knowing that the virus, even though someone has passed away, has died, the virus is still alive to just reflect on those that are standing around the dead. And the system of burial at that time, the like Muslims, you can see them going there, washing the body, standing there, crying, doing a lot, lot of that thing. So, a lot of infection were just taken at that particular time. So the government introduced the barrier system, the defy barrier system sponsored by World Vision and the government at that time. So they paid a lot of money to the to the grave diggers at that time. They doubled their payments. So they are very happy with that. You know, a lot of money were poured in by the grave, uh, uh, grave diggers at that time. And even the nurses, they were risking their lives at that time to attend to the people that are sick, you know, doing this and whatever. So they, they added the money on the nurses. So a lot of money were given to these nurses. So as time goes on, people, when, when the, the Ebola was a bit minimized, I think they, they okay. have some control of mini, uh, Ebola, they, they dropped down the money that was given to these nurses. So there was a lot of money making at that time. That's why people were even against the, the idea of this uh, barrier team. They say government just giving them money to help kill people at that time. 
the day at him. Okay, thank you. So, for that. I'm, I'm yeah. afraid that that is all we have time for. Um, yeah. um, but uh, I think it's really important to hear from the three of you. So thank you, Esther, uh, Marion, and Fode. Um, okay, um, unfortunately, we don't have any more uh, time for questions now, although we'll reply to some of them in the chat. Um, and I'll instead hand straight over to Melissa Leach, who will run our third session.